because the world will be inspired by this material. That's that's what we do. We, we like to share this kind of stuff. And you're much better at that than we have been. Mm. We're the old school here. Trying to do revolutionary things with the old school is not always the best way to go. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So, so, you know, I guess the, the thing that I've been trying to do a little bit, I haven't done enough of it, is look at what's going on in a mycelium area related to insulin and protection. And I don't know whether you know who Eco Veda is. I do. In New York. I do. Okay. We had a Peter McCoy who does radical mycology. We grow, we did things like grow mushrooms in our aquaponic greenhouse, so we got exposed to that as insulation material. Yep. But haven't haven't pursued it or anything. Okay. Well, I mean, it's sort of now they have what eight or nine licenses out there. Mm -hmm. Okay. They have, they have, I think, about the same patents. In fact. Mm -hmm. So I get question the other day before I did my research is you know an open source what happens when you bring something into the mix that actually somebody has patented and you your comment was don't do that and so then I researched a little bit further and I realized there's so many people doing this mycelium stuff beyond the food category or the psychedelic category now mm -hmm. that I can't imagine mm. that a flower and going into your backyard and picking some mushrooms and chopping them up and putting them into a solution and mixing it up can possibly be protected. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, and uh, we had a visit by the Contemporary Art Museum here with a sculptor from uh, California that had a big exhibit at the Contemporary downtown. Mm -hmm. And I what was going on with some of the mycelium samples that we had, he went crazy and did an entire wall in the Contemporary Museum, 40 feet high, with mycelium information. Mm -hmm. So, when they took the exhibit down, I have mycelium panels of two foot by two foot in every direction around here. Yeah. So open the drawer and all of a sudden somebody sees a mycelium panel being stored. Uh-huh. So we have it all around us. So I went and researched this a little bit to the extent of, wow, well, there are building panels, there are insulated panels that are fireproof, mm -hmm. that are hemp reinforced, mm -hmm. that are out there. I think it's an English group that's doing that. Uh-huh. And any license, whatever, from Ecofin. Yeah. But I spent the life of me figure out, you know, where does open source or closed source or whatever you might call it become a blockade, and I can't see where the blockade is. No, no, there isn't. I mean, it's a, to us, we look at it as an advantage in the sense that we can invite more people to the table to actually collaboratively develop. Now the only missing link is their mindset. Like if they're if they're very protective and I think essentially not thinking at a large enough scale, then they're gonna say, "Oh, we gotta protect it. There's not enough for all of us." But we think, "No, no, the problems are bigger than groups can solve. We gotta all collaborate, open the doors to that, and that way we have good energy on our side, more resources." It's it's more fun. Like I choose that because it's actually you know it's it's more rewarding. Like the dynamics between people as well. Well, as Bob knows, we like fun. So yeah. I have an argument with fun. So I think go to the next level. And I guess the, my real question is, have you ever tried doing this? We sell all our stuff. Like for example, uh, the brick press. 3D printers, they're all open source. We make money by selling them and teaching people. Like we sell products, we teach people in workshops. We've been able to survive the last decade on on bootstrap funding because we got a little bit of foundation funding but now that ran out a long time ago and we're programmatically funded by revenue from product sales and education workshops. So I guess, you know, honing down a little bit into the panel issue. Yeah. This 
would be you guys producing a panel that is then sold to projects that BIM is involved with. And who would go over all of the issues of uh, engineering and testing and fire and structure? And we have some... Some development talent in house, but most of it is once again collaboration. So we would pay for that, get collaborations, standard standard things. Somebody's got to at the end of the day, the day pay for it. In a in a revenue model, you assume that you have funds that then are used for further research and development purposes. So, yeah. like for example, with the CD home that we're building right now, which which I think we're getting good data points. So currently, it's the summer of extreme design build, and we're building that house, and we're taking data points of build time and predicting a certain revenue model. But at, at that point, we're looking at okay, here's 25k profit for OSC per house. Well, we reinvest that in R and D. So it's yeah. just good old, like it. good old entrepreneurial. Uh, innovation it has to be innovation because, of course, we're pushing some limits, in different directions, and yeah, yeah, it's it's just enterprise. Okay, so let's say that we figured out a mold system and a way of extracting this whole thing out. Mm -hmm. And you know the the interesting thing that if I was an IP nut, I would sort of say this is IP, but in actuality, in talking about open source. It's a very interesting uh, combination, and I don't know whether you realize that MGO anything deters the growth of organisms on it. So from an indoor air quality standpoint, okay. MGO panels are very good. Excellent. So if I were to jump a little bit, and I were to say, all right, let's pour some of the MGO and let's put some... Uh, Hemp fibers in it into the bottom of a form, and while it's wet, you know, this is a very, very preliminary idea, but I'd like to put it out there to see if the wisdom on this call has anything to say. And that is, while it's wet, you actually put in the wet mycelium mix. Mm -hmm. So it literally sticks and it heats into that bottom pore in the mold. Mm -hmm. And then what happens is that you let it do its thing for a bit, and it grows. Mm -hmm. And it goes over the top of the mold, usually. Mm -hmm. Sometimes Coveta puts a lid on it and controls that. Uh, and if it goes over, you screen it off, just the way you do with any cement, whatever. Mm -hmm. Or you keep the panel on, but the interesting thing to me is... If you pour the second layer of your SIP panel of the MGO hemp mix again on the top, then it goes into all the crevices of, of, of the uh, of the mycelium mix and really develops a bond of which we don't know how good that bond is yet. But it is interesting. We had a hemp creek workshop by a bunch of Colorado nuts here about three or four months ago, mm -hmm. and I was extremely impressed with what some of these folks brought to the table, including a very lightweight, mycelium, beautiful looking small panel, and a totally fireproof, and a very strong, hemp reinforced. So I said, how did you do that? He said, well, I went to EcoVeda and I got their kit, and I mixed it up, and I put some hemp in. I said, wow, pretty bloody impressive. So he, I said, well, what are you going to do with it? He said, I don't know yet, but do what you want. This is what I did. Take it with you. So I said to myself, well, that that is good. And then I sort of put my lid on of, you know, well, what my silly thing is. Oh, I don't know that. That's Eco Beta. And then I asked, well, can I go to my backyard and pick up a mushroom and chop it up and put it into some solution and come up with spore growth and put something in there, who knows what, sugar to make it work better and then pour it into my my wood mix? And he said, I don't know anything about that. That's what Ecoveda evolved and developed. 
But now, as you go into the open source thing, what's sort of the interesting about this is that there are thousands of mycelliums. And they're all over the world. Yeah. So if one goes to their backyard and picks one, arbitrarily, or one goes to their backyard and takes a hardwood chip versus a softwood chip, all these things make a big difference, and all these things are what is going on intensively in Germany and New York State and, my, and the eco Veda people and a whole German team of microbiologists into this heavily that I just discovered this week. And that's what I began to realize, my goodness, there's something that's open source going on here, otherwise the Germans couldn't be going nearly as far as they did, but then I go and I sort of say, well, where do you start? You just start, or do you ask questions, or are you infringing, or what? What so I would do, what I would do, is I would reach out to all the people and, and invite them to a larger collaboration, so set up a, a way to sign up to this effort with an explicitly open collaborative license or open collaborative intent and see who wants to collaborate and there will be people who are forward thinking and they will be willing to do that others will just drop out but we don't care about the people that drop out because those are the people that are not going to share the top information anyway so we work with the people that do subscribe to collaborative development and go from there see what existing open source prior art there is and build upon it okay so let's say that in bob's and my life we get all mixed up with you know some things are proprietary some things are not bob comes up the building says he depends on this he said martian i hope that you can produce millions of these out of your Kansas farm. Mm -hmm. I have 180 homes to do for this developer. Yeah. So, and I am in exactly the same state because unintentionally I become very wealthy. Mm -hmm. and wealth happens to be, I have 27 acres of land in Austin, Texas on a corner of four lanes to four lanes. And I'm cordoning off my nonprofit and I'm trying to get people, developer wise, who are friends who want to do our building system on the rest of it in very innovative uh, ways that bridge between young and old and all the modern way of doing demographic equality. And I say, let's go. And they say, let's go. And so Bob and we have people that are putting investment into a development that are fairly normal investor type people, but with an in-between guy like Bob or like, uh, in our case, it's um, uh, Chris Yeager who did Solar, which is a development in Austin. It has won many awards and is the only... Uh, sensibly priced dream development that I've ever seen anywhere is about 20 minutes from here. So when he approached us as being one of the developers, I said, fantastic, let's go. He said, but I have investors coming out of Chicago. And I said, oh, what do they do? <laughs> <laughs> and so they said, well, he said, well, gives me lots of money. And I said, well, what's the control they have over you? And he said, I'm testing that out, and you're one of my tests. I said, great. What should I say? And he said, careful, say, because I don't want to have them disappear the next day because I've met a crazy group of people in Austin, Texas that want to do miracles, and they want to make money. So... Bob and I are in this flex state <laughs> of having to deal with that world yeah. and deal with your OS open course way of operating. Yeah. And somewhere or other, you know, money people come in, move things up. So have you ever been into 
into a screw-up situation? Well, no, I mean, see, we don't have traction yet. I mean, we, we've been around, but as far as economic traction, we've been prototyping things the last decade. So, no, we haven't had screw-up situations. We never, we, we don't do a lot of investors. The investors we like to think about is lifestyle investors, people who, say, say for example, for right now, the people that are here are people interested in learning how to build this house as a business, for example. So those are the kind of investors that pay us. So we're not dependent on, on capital. Now, uh, what to do in your case? That's the that's okay. a relevant question. Um, how do you live? How do I live? Yeah, how do you live? Somewhere there's money. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, the, I mean, the, uh, we're very ambitious. At the same time, we're just saying we're going to do this long, long time to rise because we are very careful about who we take money from. And uh, like we don't do grants, we haven't done it historically. Just we, we just spend our time buying metal and prototyping. <laughs> uh, we um, haven't done capital because that's you lose control. That's, it's somewhat inconsistent. So we bootstrap revenue this stuff. So we sell products. So that's why with this house, I mean, this is intended to be quite a scalable operation. So for example, if those guys don't want to build, we are getting ready to build. So we, we have a first build coming up in December in terms of the housing that we do our style, just a simple stick frame that we're evolving into compressed earth block for next year. But we're going to keep going at it. We think that the, the housing, sales from housing, uh, our, our business model is 100K house, 50K materials, 25K labor, 25K profit for the organization, uh, and scaling that. So we're talking about doubling it. I mean, our goal is to double every single year for the next decade, uh, reach at least a billion dollar scale within 10 years. I don't know if you, if that's acceptable for time scale. That's, that's kind of the time scale I'm living on where the, the open source collaboration is a big deal. It's much more powerful than software and we're writing that and, and doing it slowly with, with the kind of things that we do, which is still products, developing pro solid products that we can then manufacture, produce in a dual education production model. So we're also training people, we're starting up a training activity like like the apprenticeship that we run um, but how do we live I mean we, I, I, I would say that Katrina and I have effectively taken a vow of poverty I would say but but we're not opposed to we're not opposed to revenue we're, we've got high ambitious goals uh, but we're taking our time together that's 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 where we're at does that kind of clarify or it does it, it, it sort of um makes me wonder about the original question I had. Let's say that Bob and I yeah. have a development of 180 houses. Yeah. And we are working with you and you pick up on this idea by selling him an MGO and it's open sourced and we purchase from you assuming that you can get a manufacturing facility together to get to the point of where we could say to you know, investors at our end that say, I'll put money into this if we can be sure that this can happen. Yeah. So I guess one of my questions has been, okay, you are the manufacturer of this panel and the first application of the panel is in your stick frame house, which by the way, you know, I am totally open with whatever building system there is as long as it makes super sense yeah so as an example you know the other day I go across the street to a very successful developer that has picked up land 200 feet from us and up goes 300 apartments so here's Max's pod and their little bubble and now we look at 300 apartments and so I got fascinated and I went over and I started to take pictures. Yep, go ahead. The amount of wood guys are using and the amount of labor yeah. and putting sticks. And I thought to myself, you know, these guys are planting a forest. Yeah. It happens to be human forest <laughs> and there's a shipload yeah. of wood and there's a hell of a lot of carbon sink going on and a hell of a lot of jobs being given. And I've been sort of taking the attitude for years that sticks are not the way to go. And all of a sudden I said, shit, maybe I'm 
maybe we ought to really do a better comparison of CLT mania going on, stick framing, the amount of jobs, the amount of, of you know basic training that it needs for these jobs to occur. And you know, I saw 80 people on the job site putting up sticks. And yeah. it's hard to argue right. about you know, other ways of operating until you actually compare. So I came back to my friend Rich McMath and I said, you know, we ought to do or recon reconsider and do a paper comparing all this stuff again because some of our assumptions might not be right. Sure. So I am totally open if it makes sense. Now, the other thing that I sort of, in our organization, are fairly adamant about, and that is that the user participates. Now, the user in our yeah. case says, you know, my family changes, my life changes, all of a sudden, grandmother moves in, and the whole building has to evolve. Yes. My kid flunked out of college and all the things that happen in life. And here I'm critiquing my developer friend, Chris Yeager, who has a very successful modular home business. But he produces his modules, you know, 10 feet wide by 40 feet long, all stick frame and pulled up by a gigantic crane and lifted onto each other into multi-story. And I say, Chris, this might not be the future, although there's some things that you're doing that I can agree with. But he says, well, what are you not agreeing with? And I say, well, how does something change? And he says, oh, I just pick it up and flip. So I said, what does that mean? Your crane comes by again, and you pick up something, and you flip it around? He says, sure, that could be one way. And I said, that is crazy. Go ahead, Mush. The stick frame is, is part of the bootstrapping approach. So we're going to make boatloads of money with it so we can bootstrap further R&D. Actually, the, the thing we're thinking about is uh, solving the plastic issue as well. So we, we build large-scale 3D printers. We'd like to do the panels with them. So we, we see possibility of doing the 3D printed panels. Uh, now, that's just one thing, but we, we've done compressed earth block before. I'm into whatever whatever works. Right now, we know that the world builds with stick. We can ride that wave, but we are not into centralization. We are not into lack of innovation. We're like small, agile, distributed. Therefore, we, we're like, okay, let's get some cash flow, and then we can continue on um, on the innovation because we're, we're into innovation. We're not into... If, if that business is successful, we ask, the first question is, we ask is, okay, how do we transition this to something that makes more sense, that is better, bigger, fa better, faster, stronger? That's the open source approach. Uh, so we, the stick might do it for cash flow, but it's not going to do it for the long term. Uh, it might be all, also relevant to only a small section of the world, like most of the world lives in houses made of dirt. So yeah, and things I like that. Housing and promoted dirt and done all that, it also begins to get people doing things in sometimes a very inefficient way. And this first hit me when I dealt with the Cinder Ram. And the Cinder Ram is the most impossible piece of equipment that I've ever seen in my life that was perpetuated yeah. by the Rockefeller Brothers Fund. Yeah. And all of that made all effect. Rockefeller Brothers Fund wants people to build out of earth so they stay put and don't cause any trouble in the world. Wow, that's a very cool critique, yeah. Interesting, I, I so, didn't hear that angle yet, but um, it makes sense because I know the pain, we've had right. one, we've, we've worked with one. Yeah, and so earth in one sense, sure it's available, but how you work with it becomes either a problem or a solution. And then, you know, the whole thing about, you know, the fact that Adobe is Sandy Long in this agricultural soil is the most absurd thing that I've ever run into. And yet there's a global following of Adobe nuts. So whenever I go to a conference that has Adobe and I present, I either get spitball sent to me or I am praised. And it's a very few people that praise to say, you know, 90% of the folks at this conference, this Earth Conference FISC, 
use Adobe, you're the only presentation that is not. But I'm still using Earth Guides, and the title of this conference is Earth USA. It's just you're using the wrong Earth. But it's sort of one of these things where, okay, great, and therefore an Earth nut. In certain circumstances, I am. For my Earth, which is Kalichi, but if I'm going to go and build things that people are going to evolve over time themselves, it's not always the best way of operating because these things are heavy. They uh, need masonry skills. They need equipment. They need this. They need that. And so when I'm doing my S-Pod thing, I'm trying to make First of all, larger, lighter, insulated panels, maybe with bio-PCM in them to get the mass going, because I do not like to cart around mass, either by people lifting it or by trucks taking it. Are you opposed to, to lower than the soil but subsoil, like deeper so that you can actually do CEBs without interfering with, with agriculture? Sure, that's fine. The only okay. thing is user end of the issue is for me and my work and I work with farm workers and many people on the border you, you're very conscious are you trying to really help folks in the long term or are you actually getting them into doing things that put them into a permanent state of poverty no 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 we dog food everything we don't put anything out that we haven't or aren't using ourselves so that's the way we operate I've, I've built CB homes and stuff like that. I know the pain. Uh, I think there are solutions, too. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've lived in these buildings forever, myself. I've uh, offices yeah. this, done schools this way, et cetera, et cetera. But I'm just sort of very conscious of critiquing myself as much as critiquing the rest of the world. Yeah. To say, you know, they're constantly a checkpoint that you're going and evolving to the next point. Sure. I mean, the next thing that I'm presenting at US, Earth USA, if they ever have me again, is something that is Earth grown, like hemp, into bioplastics that are degradable. So sure. both ends of the life cycle are really relevant. Yeah. Let's talk about what, what the collaboration on the panels. Let's talk about the MGO panels. Can we continue that? Sure. Well, I'm building up to that. So I can take Please. that MGO panel and I can grind it and I can put it into the ground. Yeah. And it actually helps things because a lot of soils are magnesium deficient. Mm -hmm. Or if I use hemp for reinforcing either the mycelium and or the MGO, the hemp can be done in such a way that it's based on a circular economy. Yeah. If we were to do it here, where do we get the magnesium? Well, you know, it's a good question because I've never done a DIY way of doing magnesium. It's sort of the old cement thing. You go to the store and you buy it. So there are many people that produce, produce MGO cement that you purchase by the bag. Mm -hmm. It's not cheap. So, but if I were to go and to make the MGO, you know, the old, old technique was called solar ponds. Mm -hmm. That's how magnesium was made. Or a more modern way is to actually desalinate and take the brine and pull it out. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That isn't easy. You need membranes, you need techniques you need all sorts of things to specially pull that MGO out yeah. but even though it makes up you know it's number four in the whole blind sequence of things so it's highly available but then yeah. you do have to so all these things are you know Bob your 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 phone your volume is off Can't hear you. Bob, did you say something? I did. Can you hear me now? No, there you are. Okay. 
I was I was wanting to know how much real estate is required to do what you just described. You mean you mean the whole the whole mining and the manufacturing process or what? Yeah. Part? Yeah. Well, just 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 this uh, solar pond portion of the process. Um. I don't know the ratio offhand of how much pond that you need for how much brine and how much magnesium you're getting out. That's what I mean. Yeah, I, I'm not that sharp. You got a really sharp <laughs> guy called Merchant there, who is a physicist. He'll know though. So, how haven't, much pond do we need? Haven't looked into it. Haven't looked at any of those numbers. But I mean, it's one of these things where. There seems to be a, a jump that's needed to go to the next level so that we get what used to be called intermediate technology into that kind of thing and not all the high tech stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But yeah. at the moment, you know, if I were to start this project out, uh, I would not go to all the levels of perfection and you know manufacture and go and and kiln dry kiln cure do this that and the other thing i say you know who's out there that's doing as close as i can get yeah all from them but have as you do version a bigger vision of what this whole thing is about but get going and get some money flow out of it so get bags of magnesium cement yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I can go and right now, forget the mixing, I can go and get panels. Mm -hmm. Now I won't come out with the absolute optimum building panel because my mycelium and its expansion won't, won't adhere into that magnesium panel because it's smooth. And so I have to come up with some other technique in between to make a panel that actually adheres to your insulation, which as we know, SIP panels adhere to that insulation. They use glues, and they use this, and they use that. Do we have, um, between, sorry, can I ask, does the magnesium kill the, my, kill the mycelium that grows on it, or it's quite well, safe for the fungus? But as far as I can tell, it is a deterrent for growth things in general. Mm -hmm. as to whether it kills it or not is not as much of an issue as it is not a substrate that it wants to have things grow on. Mm -hmm. from, the, from the health building aspect, that is why magnesium panels are often sold. They're sold by two things, fire and health. Those are the basic two things for why those panels are being sold. Mm -hmm. But if I break this out and I try to get going and try to satisfy you know how do we make a panel tomorrow I would go and order the panels magnesium I'd go to Franklin I'd go to Ecoveda and I'd say you know what is this little kit that you guys have uh, is there some mycelium that you found that actually is much better than all the other thousands of myceliums send me a bottle of that and I'll mix it up with my uh, my wood chips and by the way uh, Ecoveda which wood chips do you like to use so I try to start someplace where I don't have to go and do all the research from the get go and come out with a panel yeah we've got a good good mycology guy I mentioned Peter McCoy who does radical mycology he wrote a book on a topic uh, so, he's a, quite an open source guy. Hmm? A very good book. Yeah. So, he's he's on our team. He's a collaborator. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. Oh, man. I don't he got it. Because we're open. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, we can get going tomorrow. Yeah. So, uh, if you use hemp fiber, is that... How does that compare to rebar or fiber, glass fiber rebar? Well, I mean, the critique of, you know, using extensively magnesium oxide cements is depending on the which of the three that you use, and there are three basic ones, some sulfate-based, some chloride-based, some phosphate-based, mm -hmm. that water gets in and destroys your rebar. 
But mm-hmm. as you look at other research, you begin to say, wow, natural fibers in regular Portland cement is not good. They will deteriorate. Natural fibers in magnesium oxide-based material do not react with that organics. And so those fibers stay forever. So if I take whatever fiber, I don't care what it is, sisal, hemp, many different fibers that I can put into that to make it stronger. But then I come up with the issue, is this building system an actual structural insulated panel versus an insulated panel? There's a big, big difference. And so if I'm applying a panel onto a structure that already exists, I don't want to do all this work. I want to maybe just the, take that myself so panel itself and, and, you know, nail it on onto my wood frame. Yeah, I, I would go with 3D printed frames that you then work with the mycelium and concrete and all that. So that's, the 3D printed part I think is the part of the solution here. Because you can okay. do the lattices or whatever you like. Okay. So, you know, I'm old and I'm very difficult to get along with. So the difficulty that I have with 3D printing, and I have 3D printers here, use 3D printers for years, Doing EPod with a 3D printer. Yeah. Dealing with re3d.org out of Houston. Got it. Yeah. And not doing whole buildings with 3D printers because it does not connect to my need for change. In fact, it is so totally the opposite the way it's being done. You, you puncture those walls and your entire building goes down. Whereas what I'm doing with S-Pod, I can take a panel out and a panel here, change things, make the building grow, and let people adapt because of the size of the 3D print that I come out with. So I am not... Um, the, only, the only large 3D printing thing that I've ever been involved with is with my friend Wolf Hilbert's in Ice City in 1973 in Fargo, North Dakota. And so we could actually print out of ice, but we could dissipate with flame flowers in a second if we don't like what we did and try it again. Yeah, but the 3D printing here I'm talking about is the panel scale. <laughs> I think we might be talking about the same thing if, if the 3D printing scale is that of panels. Panel scale. Okay, so why would you do panels out with 3D printers? Because they provide a form, like you talked about molds. That's the mold. Okay. Uh, well, it might be, you know, I mean, there might, you have, do you have a diagram or a drawing or anything of how you do this with a 3D printer? Uh, no. The idea is uh, the enabling thing. So, so for us, the it is solving stuff solving issues as in the plastic waste issue if you can use just about any plastic using high temperature 3D printing chambers which do not exist or exist in like quarter million dollar machines at a smaller size. So we can do that. We're prototyping that in like a couple of weeks from now. But the idea is use any kind of waste plastic that you reprocess into 3D printing filament. And um, what's... If we're talking about molds that's that's where i would say okay yeah you can do this if you want mold structures that you fill with cements or other materials that would be great our initial goal was here's we can print actual panels we use right now are four by eight and four by ten just lumber so we're going to replace that with 3d printing so i can i can get you more more result in a few weeks because those large printers we're actually building, we've got a crew of people here right now, we're actually building that uh, coming up shortly. Okay, well, we're cooperating with another dot .org, which is R3D out of Houston. Mm-hmm. It, they're printers worldwide now, and they make Megabot 10, and they make, you know, anything from an $8,000 kit that will produce the panels, the smallest increment of the panel that we have in S-Pod, all the way up to, you know, uh, sizes 
that are about, well, it's about 500 by 700 uh, uh, mm. And I don't know what that is off the top of my head in inches, but it does everything that we need. But I can get that not even in kit form, all done, packaged and to my doorstep for $17,000 and it will print out of hemp. And it will print out of hemp either filament or in chips. So oh, what's I can the... start manufacturing tomorrow with a 3D printer. What's the hemp? You're talking about hemp 3D printing filaments, so hemp embe embedded in plastic? Hemp is on the hemp filament for 3D printing is on the market right now. You have to be very conscious of the temperature and so on that you're using in your machine. But I've gone over this whole thing with R2 3D and they say plenty, no problem. What we'd like to do, however, to speed up print time is that we like to use pellets and let them feed and not use filament. I say, that's fine with me. And I say, well, how, what does the print time change? And they said 17 fold. And I said 17 fold. Now we're talking because what is totally exasperating to me is the slow rate the 3D printers print. And when, when you I'm say you got to back up to the hemp filament. You, you don't print hemp. How do you bind it together? There's a binder within that filament. I'm asking, what is that? And is that sufficient for the purposes? It's a bioplastic, hemp bioplastic, with a hemp fiber, tiny, micro, tiny fibers of hemp in it, as far as I know. Now, they don't tell me exactly what they're doing. But I say, is this 100% hemp? And they say 100% hemp. Now, the other thing that R2-3D does do is they print with 100% recycled plastic. So I said, well, if I can't pull off the head thing at the moment, and, and your your nozzle is too expensive to get the hemp thing going and the temperatures and this and the other thing, let's go to 100% recycled plastic. And they said, this, we can do that tomorrow. And, but they, they deal with communities worldwide. They have thousands of their printers up and they print it virtually all scales but if I were to go to industry 3D printers they are a fortune as you know but I can start off with a very ample unit and I have the room set up with air conditioning and everything which is rare around here uh, to put that 3D printer in and start producing you know, at the first level, my furniture, because S Pod produces furniture, it's drawn furniture. So and I'm my question is, because of the hurricanes, all the shit that happens in Texas. Well, the the very important question and equation is the little elephant under the <laughs> in the in the room here, which is the cost of that filament. That's where you get killed without high temperature print chambers. You cannot use any plastic. That's the requirement right now for 3D printing to scale to any form of construction, in my viewpoint, is the ability of using trash and just about any plastic by as enabled by high temperature built chambers. Re3D does not do that. No, they do not do that. They're only certain Recycle plastics that they right. use. That's very limited. Yeah. That's why it's not solving problems. We're talking about solving real problems, and solving real problems means you can use any plastic from the waste stream. That's what we're doing. So there is there is a game changer there, just for okay. clarity. Okay, so that's true. And what you can do with any plastic, and it becomes structural, and right. it becomes this, um, I'm totally with you. But right, right now, if I were to start tomorrow... If you do tomorrow, then we can't do that. You have to wait. Okay, how long do I have to wait? We're building this printer in, in about uh, two or three weeks. Next month, early early next month. So are you familiar with the, <coughs> the whole lineup of R2, 3D people? Uh, I know the company. I haven't talked to them much. Just a short email exchange on them. Okay. Because there's a lot of parallel. I mean, they have kit printers, large, and they have 
printers that only use filament. <coughs> Excuse me. They have filament. They have printers that do both. They have the plastic recycled plastic. Now it might not be the ideal plastic that you want, but they. I'm amazed that they're doing this. By the way, Austin Chamber of Commerce had a competition that they won that enabled them to go to the plastic about eight years ago. So I've been following them ever since. Mm -hmm. But, you know, and they didn't knew nothing about the hemp film. I had to tell them about it, and they got the specs, and they said, plenty these specs are a little bit different than what we're accustomed to, but it looks as though we can actually do it. I said, great. But it will cost you an extra thousand dollars to set up the printer to do that. And I said, no thanks at the moment. And the cost of the filament. Yeah, now the cost of the filament, as far as I can tell from the from the distributors of filament that have access to the hemp, there's not that big a difference in price at all. In fact it's about, you know, thirty three, thirty four dollars a roll, and I think with the hemp people it's about one or two dollars difference. Yeah, but, but the, both those numbers don't work for construction materials. That's too yeah. high, 10x to 100x too high for okay, so significant that, construction. The, so the construction material thing that they offer, they say, you know, plenty, we can do anything you want. You want things printed out of nylon? We'll print out of nylon. You want things printed out of this or that or whatever it is, but we offer a service. And so we do FEA engineering analysis. You choose the material. We have the printer, and we'll show you the thickness and the amount of reinforcing and all these things that have to be done depending on your use. And I said, well, my use is disaster housing with 150 mile an hour winds. And he said, we put that into our engineering analysis, and we take the increment of your panel, and we uh, multiply it by however many times in a wall, and we look at your, your crazy pipe, pipe connection and we say this will work or it won't work and we do and, and so that's a service that they have along with their printer and that's the only printer group that I've seen that actually provides that service mm -hmm. so I'm not getting into so, so okay I'm gonna so if we switch back to mycelium and the MGO as a path. So I have a very conservative way of how I would be working with, you know, R2-3D. And that is that they would do joints, surely mm -hmm. joints at the moment. I would do panels in a fairly traditional, normal sense, the way panels are done. I mean, panels have presses, they have frames that are poured into and you pop these panels out and you put them into use. I do not try to get art to 3D saying I want to produce a mycelium core magnesium oxide panel. They'd say, honey, this will take, you know, four hundred thousand dollars worth of R and D work. Now maybe mission mushroom you have that in good shape and you can do the NGO because NGO is magic it sets up 20% I mean 20 minutes 90% of its structural value and so that part's done it is the sandwiching and all that that I don't understand how you do with a 3D printer because I've never seen first of all NGO printed 3D nor have I seen mycelium printed 3D You've got me stumped. Well, the only thing I could say immediately is if you fill in the form, you cap it with another thing while the, while the MGO would be still wet. That's something that comes to my mind right now. But um, I would say we, we go forward on, on uh, these panels. So you're talking about lightweight panels that are human scale that, that are high performance in essence. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's our game. And I have two different building systems. One that sort of meets the U.S., um, what would I call it, the aesthetic developer market. 
Yeah, yeah that's, that's us. us. <laughs> okay. But I've done a very thing. I have actually made this whole thing interoperable. And I presented this last night to my team for the first time, and they actually began to buy it because I say, you know, from homeless, of which our city has tremendous problems, mm -hmm. to owning a home is what I call maximum potential voting system. So if I have a panel that actually works in both worlds, in my SPOD world of disaster relief housing, which can be tiny housing, can be homeless housing, can be whatever, and it also relates to my developer version, I have a way of crossing these two worlds. And I cross these two worlds basically with materiality and dimensionality. So my dimensions, it's a little bit weird, but it is meter based. So my 10 foot is three meters. Mm -hmm. My 10 foot, if I were to use my small paddle, is, you know, six paddles. If I use a bigger paddle, and I'm switching over to my developer version, that paddle is vertically two of my smaller paddles, but built as one paddle. But it's connected in exactly the same way that I do my small battles. So I'm a little bit, you know, persistent. It'd be a little bit too far afield, but I'm talking to you, and you're so far afield that I can't believe it. So none of these things should be in any way an issue. Well, thank, thank you. you. Now, as far as the SPOD system, is that technical design actually open source? Or are, you, are, you, are the connectors there? Proprietary? Well, if I figure out how to make any money soon, I will pass the entire thing over to you and it will become open source. Because at the moment, because I can't get an investor into being interested in homelessness. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. So, focusing one thing at a time, let's do these magnesium panels. So, how do we proceed on that? Okay. Well, uh, I send you my drawings that I've done, that hopefully, well, hopefully my intern will have done mm -hmm. by the end of the day. And we start talking about okay. it, and I go, and I guess, you know, there's a little bit of work to be done, because I don't know for sure that if I go out in my backyard, and I look at a mushroom, and I take it, and I crunch it up, and I put it into a solution, and I pour it onto my wood chips, whether this has a chance in the world of working. Mm -hmm. Well, you also have to put flour in because I need an immediate food source yeah. to get going on. And the wood chips basically become the aggregate. What's the timing we're talking about per panel? So, so you're talking about biological time scales, which are like three weeks for a panel? Or how, how much are we talking about? Well, I, it depends on your thickness and it depends and what you're doing and the mix and the strength and the this and the other thing. But, you know, let's say that if you looked at a YouTube video of EcoVeda's uh, Dell or Samsung uh, uh, television packaging, yeah. they're making a four, that they have anywhere from four to nine days total for the initiation to out the door. Do you know if they're GMO, or is this natural strains? I do not know. Mm -hmm. No idea. That's what I'm saying. Can I go in my backyard and chop up some mushrooms and this will work? Because that's how yeah. it started. You know, these students at RPI, and they had a project due the next day, and they were frantic, and they were stoned, and they were in the New York State woods. <laughs> and <looked at> mushrooms. <laughs> <laughs> because some of the friends ended up to be interns here so I got the whole boat out yeah it's kind of like the hemp houses if it ever catches yeah. on fire yeah. <laughs> it gets stoned yeah okay uh, uh, you know I have that little barrier in my mind and, and you know I can go out in my woods and be stoned and pick up a mushroom and quite honestly <laughs> But I'd love to start with some degree of knowledge. Yeah, so we asked Peter McCoy <laughs> of okay. Radical Mycology. Yeah, let's, let's get him into this. Yeah. And the community does call us Max's Pot. 
Yeah. yeah. That causes problems. Mm-hmm. Oh. Uh, <laughs> okay. Yeah. Now these drawings, like this, this is this is open information. Can I, can I publish that on a wiki and stuff like that, or? You can, except I did one other thing that I might, in order to attract a little bit of investment at my end, mm -hmm. that uh, I have in it that would be uh, not open source, but it might be. I mean, we can we can talk about this. So I put in between the top layer. And the mix of mycelium, top layer being the NGO, middle being the mycelium mix, a sprinkling of PCMs. What's PCM? Phase change material. Okay. So all of a sudden, I have my Adobe structure with its mass, with insulation on the outside of it, that I can improve my energy by up to 40% proven and modeled across the United States. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, this is as a heat storage medium, or how does that work? Heat storage, heat release medium. Yeah. It's just like what NASA did in the 60s and 70s with their wax. Depends on which waxes that you mix together to determine the reversal temperature. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But that is all on the market by several different groups now and I can get the pellets reversing at whatever temperature for my climate for whatever sprinkled into my panel yeah so the question on the mushroom the mycelium what is the part that makes it so durable do they have some kind of a treatment I would assume that does that once the thing is baked there's some treatment that stabilizes the fibers of mycelium treatment is the baking or the autoclaving it stops the growth. And that's it? You don't need to any other additives or substances that make it preserve for a long time? Uh, the only thing that I've seen and what goes on there is that they're very, very careful with their molds. So they spray them with hydrogen peroxide or something much more terrible than that to make sure that they're not foreign things that are getting into the growth process. When we talk about the sealed panels, that means they're sealed for air inside? Uh, they're sealed for air. I mean, what, what, what is a missing link in this is the edge of the panel. And, and by the way, my mushrooms, as both of you know, work totally the opposite of us. So they need, they put out oxygen and they pull in CO2. Uh, actually, I would like to correct you on that, sir. They're okay. the same as us. They breathe out water and CO2 like we do. Right. They do. That's right. That's right. They do breathe out CO2. Yeah. Um, and we use that actually to attract mosquitoes in a process that I'll explain to you sometime. Because mosquitoes like CO2 and they like the smell of people. Mm. And so we of the smell of people and the CO2 by making a mushroom housing. And we also use luminescent mushrooms because they also like light at night. Yeah, because the mycelium, the, we talked about this here, like for example, ponds, and you dig trenches where, that you fill with wood chips, so you can have the mycelium take water uphill from a pond because they're a big conduit. Wow. And as they breathe, that, that they... Is that is that just out. beauty. No, we haven't done that, but that's, that's a... That's a obvious derivative. One, once you mix uh, Elaine Ingham's stuff, Peter My Peter's mycology stuff, and uh, integrated agriculture. Cool. Oh man, that we want to do that here. We haven't done it yet. We have done the part where you put in a lot of mulch and biomass into the soil through the. There's a forest method like the Miyawaki the Miyawaki method of afforestation where you put in a lot of bio, load, a lot of biomass into the soil. And we thought, oh well, well if we were doing these trenches already. Why not have them go uphill to actually do the watering part for large parcels of land? Yeah, that would be a cool thing. Marshall, the embarrassing thing is that if I ever visited you, I might never come back. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um. But, you know, Bob knew this, and he's known it for a while, and so he, he's the troublemaker. Thank you, Bob. 
for the introduction. <laughs> so, uh, can you hear me now? Yes. I have to, I have to run, but I'm yeah. delighted with this first conversation. Yeah, it's and great. I think we need more. Yeah. And I think uh, if we could start crafting a path to start on, mm -hmm. shooting for a particular product or yeah. goal or process, yep. that would make this more efficient and focused. Yes. Yes, now, I in agree. your conversation, I already have about 500 questions about other <laughs> things we could pursue oh, yeah. using the same thinking. But I think to advance this partnership, uh, I think particularly for the two of you to think about what is the most appropriate next move, what is a goal we could set and try to accomplish together with one of these products. Yeah, as soon as we see the panel design, we can take a look at, okay, what, what does it yeah. take to actually produce that? Yeah. I mean, if we could add that to the CECO home today, that would be awesome. I mean, we think about this. We want to do new materials. By the way, Bob, we are going to cement panels on the, on this version, so we did that Great. upgrade already. Yes. Great. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks, you guys. I hate to leave, but yeah. I have to. I need to go to... forward to the continuation of this. I think really productive dialogue. This was great. Yeah, I think we actually should try to assign a time every week or something. Friday next sure week. Because there's so yeah. many other things that we could be talking about that relate to this subject mm -hmm. without mm -hmm. going, as Gail says, don't scope creep, focus. We can focus just on what we're talking about and get all the different innuendos out on the table. Okay. Yeah. Excellent. I agree. And Fisk, I think we do need to get you to march, march in place, and vice versa. Yeah, I'd lo love to see it. Mm -hmm. That's a longer agenda, but yeah. that needs to happen. Yeah. And it might also be that we meet in between on the East Texas, East of Dallas, rather, Texas Pulse Wave Processing Facility. Oh, I see. Because you mm. can go totally crazy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Excellent. Look forward to it. <laughs> okay, so those two things. So somebody's going to suggest a time every week. Maybe it's noon on Fridays. Noon on Friday, yes. Next week. I'll send you an invite. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks so much. Great I conversation. Thanks by the end of today or this weekend. Excellent. Thank you plenty. Thank you, guys. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.